Well, uh, come with me again uh, to the scriptures and starting out in Exodus chapter 34, uh, we'll be uh, looking at the third in our series of how Christ fulfills the significant figures or some of the significant figures of the Old Testament today, Christ, the true and better Moses. Imagine uh, we're going back several thousand years uh, to the foot of Mount Sinai uh, where Moses received the Ten Commandments uh, the first time. Uh, It's two months since the Passover, since the night that the firstborn sons of Egypt died uh, and God's people were delivered through the blood of the Lamb. They've come through the Red Sea, miraculously delivered from the forces of Pharaoh and his armies, uh, fed by manna from heaven and quail that were uh, brought miraculously to their camp day by day. And now at the foot of the mountain, they see the thunder and lightning and smoke as the glory of the Lord descends. And Moses goes to hear God's law. Now, what does that make us think about the God that we worship, the God that we know? Does it show us that it is easy to be near him, that it is easy to keep his commands? Does God allow us to waltz into his presence however we like? Does he call us as his people to be different from those around us? Now you'll notice as we come to Exodus 34 this morning that this is the second time the Ten Commandments are given. And we've seen why already in passing, uh, that even while Moses was receiving them on the mountain, They were breaking them on the plane at the bottom. Uh, Barely two months after experiencing the salvation of God, setting them free from slavery in Egypt, they turned from him to worship him in a way that was not commanded in his word. God did not give us the law to find our way to him. Though a God did not give us the law to earn our righteousness, to earn salvation. If that was the case, the Israel, that would have been the end of the Israelites. In fact, we're told at the start of the Ten Commandments, aren't we, that the law came after the Lord God had delivered them from Egypt, from the house of slavery, Exodus 20, verse 2. God did not give the law and wait for them to obey it before he saved them. Obeying the law was not the reason God gave them the promised land. No, he saved them because of his covenant promises, because of the promises he had made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And we can see that as he appears to Moses in the opening chapters of Exodus that he remembers his people and his promises. Not that he'd ever forgotten them, but he deliberately moves to act in response to his promises and sets his people free because of them. And we need to constantly keep those in the right order, that God's grace and salvation comes first. And his law for how we live as his people comes as a result. And that's my one aim for today. That from the life of Moses, we would see the law cannot bring us to God, but Jesus can. So we're going to see today then uh, the similarities and the differences between Moses and Jesus. Uh, Moses reveals God's law and Jesus reveals God's transforming gospel. And so we'll come first of all to to Exodus 34 where we see a a key moment that sums up all of Moses' life and ministry 
And we see that Moses mediated. That Moses stood between the people and God. And notice four things just from the tail end of what we read in Exodus 34 verses 29 to 35 where we have heard already a summary of the law from God's mouth himself and seen Moses being given the Ten Commandments a second time. And then we see uh, Moses coming down from the mountain to pass those commandments to God's people. Notice first that he had been in the immediate presence of God. We saw how the Lord was with him, proclaiming his name, passing before him, declaring that he is the Lord. And so he comes down the mountain with the law of God and the declaration ringing in his ears that this God is eternally gracious and just. That he shows kindness to thousands and thousands of those who call upon him. And he will not let the wicked go unpunished. Moses had gone up to meet with God as a representative for God's people. And now he comes down as the go-between, the mediator. But when he comes down the mountain, he doesn't realise something. There at the end of verse 29, that his face is glowing, radiant, because he had spoken with the Lord. And he is reflecting the glory of the God in whose presence he has been. And so second, the people are afraid at that, understandably. Even Moses' brother is afraid to come near and only comes when Moses calls out to him. Uh, Being near to God has changed Moses and people are hesitant, hesitant to be near to him. But notice thirdly that Moses isn't put off. Uh, He has a message from the Lord that he has to deliver. And so he calls out and speaks God's word to the leaders and then to the people. But what Moses does fourthly and finally, I think, is the strangest of all of these things. That when he finishes speaking, he puts a veil over his face. It seems that now at the start of the Exodus, the first of the 40 years in the wilderness, from now on, Moses will be cut off from the Israelites. That unless he is standing in the immediate presence of the Lord, he will be covered. His face will be hidden because of the reflected glory of the Lord that he shows. And so Jesus and so Moses, the leader of the Israelites. Uh, is the mediator. Uh, He is the one who goes on behalf of the people. He is the one who comes on behalf of God to the people. But we see here, having Moses as your representative, having him as your mediator does not allow any of us to come into God's presence ourselves. And that shows us a problem with the law of God, doesn't it? As we saw just a few moments ago in the the catechism, the law cannot be kept by us. It shows us the holiness of God. It shows us our own sinfulness and it shows us we need another mediator. We need another representative. We need a saviour who can open the way for us. As we saw a couple of weeks ago in question 13, We asked, can anyone keep the law of God perfectly? The answer referring to Romans 3 verse 10 was that since the the fall, no human has been able to keep the law of God perfectly. If we could, if we could obey the whole law, even that would not undo the ways we had already broken it. 
If we could try hard enough today, it would not undo yesterday. And so the law cannot save us. But Jesus is different. But Jesus is a better mediator than Moses. And what Moses could not do, Jesus did. And what was hidden and veiled in Moses is revealed with the Lord Jesus. So come with me then into the New Testament to the second passage we looked at today, which Elaine read from Matthew chapter 13. Uh, It's sandwiched in there between the parable of the sower and its explanation. And again, we see uh, an incident now in Jesus' life that sums up his ministry. Uh, What uh, Moses could not do, Jesus does. And we see here that Jesus unveils something. Jesus reveals something that we would not otherwise No, Uh, they're difficult words from Jesus here. Uh, He's been telling a parable about hearing God's word and how we respond to it. And so the disciples ask, why? Why parables? Why do you speak to the people in this way? Does Jesus' response shock us? He says, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven has been given to you, but not to them. That Jesus is deliberately shielding something from people who do not know. A people who think that they hear and think that they see and go away content, but actually knowing nothing. Jesus is showing us that not everyone can see the truth about the kingdom of heaven on our own. We can have a surface level understanding. Oh, yes, we know the story about the, the soil. You know, we know about Jesus walking on water. We know about Jesus feeding the 5,000. And yet they just seem like nice stories to us. And we can hear without understanding wonder if that happened to you at some point or or to your friends. Uh, When you first heard of Christianity or you first heard the message about Jesus, did it sound like a good way to be a good person? Uh, Do your friends and neighbours think that when you speak to them and and you say, well, look, Jesus is, is the one that we need and they just hear, well, here's how to be good, but I'm good already. Maybe the people we see or saw or thought were Christians and their lives didn't seem to be any better than the people around them. And and so we think, well, Christianity, why do we need it? We sort of hear and kind of understand it and just walk away. But Jesus is talking to his disciples and they are different. The secrets are not hidden to them. When we realise that Jesus is not just giving out good advice about getting to heaven, then it all changes. See, if we approach Jesus as, as a teacher of good old common sense and a kind of morality that will be good for our world, we will miss the point and we will go away not knowing the secret to the kingdom of heaven. When we assume Jesus is teaching a way to be a good person and not look deeper, we miss out on what Jesus reveals here. If we do not look into what Jesus says, we will only find more law there. But when we ask, we will find gospel grace. Jesus has a secret like Moses, but unlike Moses, he doesn't cover it over. He does not put it behind a veil. He says in verse 16 uh, and 17 that his disciples, his followers, those who stick with him and want to know what he's teaching, those who sit at his feet and ask questions, they see, they hear, 
because he reveals to them what the prophets and righteous people of the Old Testament had longed to see and hear. The things that were there behind the veil in the Old Testament, hinted at, promised, but not yet arrived, are revealed in the coming and teaching and living and dying of Jesus. They knew there was something significant coming. But when Jesus comes, the secrets are unveiled. The way to eternal life is revealed in him. The truth about life is shown in him. The life God offers is given by him. So this is the secret we can easily miss. This is the secret our neighbours need to hear not a, a message of here to, how to be good, how to live a great life. The secret is that we can never get to heaven on our own. That we can never measure up ourselves. We cannot enter it, we cannot even see it without being born again, born from above. That's why he warns us here. In those words from Isaiah, against having ears that don't hear and hearts that are hard and calloused, like a hard-working farmer's hands that nothing gets through. And Moses covered his face so people would not see the wonder of God's glory, but Jesus opens our eyes to see his amazing grace and goodness. He opens our ears to hear the good news of salvation, not by our law keeping, but only by his gracious gift. That is the secret that Jesus unveils for those who have ears to hear it. You see the the similarities with Moses, you see the differences. They both truthfully tell us the, the word of God. They're both mediators going between man and God. Uh, Moses points a way into God's presence uh, through a sacrifice that is needed to draw near to God. But Jesus reveals that he is the fulfilment of that, that Jesus is the sacrifice we need. And so when we approach God through Jesus, that, that veil is taken off, the truth is revealed. And we can enter in to the kingdom of God. What the law reveals that God requires, Jesus accomplishes. What the law demands, Jesus has done. A surface level understanding of Christianity and religion will lead us to say, what do I have to do to be accepted by God? How can I be good enough? That's a question about law. Jesus unveils the real way to approach God. Not by saying, what do I have to do? But what has Jesus done? What has Jesus done? And that's how we're going to finish this morning, by turning to one further passage that draws together the difference between Moses and Jesus and shows us what difference Jesus makes. And it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, from where I read at the start of the service. You'll find it uh, in your pew Bibles on page 1646 or, or in your own Bible as well. And here we see one final thing about Jesus, that not only does he tell us truth about God, but he actually transforms us through what he reveals. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 12 to 15, we have Moses and Jesus stacked up side by side and an explanation of the difference that makes for us. Notice Uh, the differences and the similarities as I read these few short verses to us. Therefore, since we have such a great hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who put a veil over his face to prevent the Israelites from seeing the end of what was passing away. 
but their minds were made dull. For to this day the same veil remains over the old co- when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this day when Moses is read, a veil covers their hearts. But whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, who with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Notice the turning point there. We see how things are with Moses. But when we get to verse 16, whenever anyone turns to the Lord Jesus, it changes. When we turn from being our own Lord and submit to Jesus, the veil comes off. When we turn from trying to keep the law to get into heaven and turn to trust Jesus alone, then our eyes are opened. Our hearts are able to perceive the truth. And so, in a way, repentance is turning from our sin, but it is also turning from our good works and expecting them to save us. A sin is turning from our rebellion, but it is also turning from our self-salvation, our attempts to be good enough and to find our way to heaven, to turn from the law to Jesus. And so what's different when we repent? Well, just a couple of quick things here. Notice the glory that Moses had was passing away. One day he died and there was no further need to veil his face. But in verse 18, the glory Jesus brings is eternal and ever increasing. When we turn to him, we experience God's glory ourselves in a way that never ends. With Jesus We don't just get a glimpse on a mountaintop of the glory and splendour that surrounds God. In Jesus, we see the fullness of his glory. In uh, in Colossians 1, 15, we're told he is the image of the invisible God. We want to see what God's glory is like. We look to Jesus. Or in Hebrews chapter 1, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. See, in Jesus, we come face to face with the glory of God. We see his divinity. We see the perfection of his nature. We see something that Moses and every other human being under the law could not see, the glory of the one who paid the price for sin. He's made reconciliation, not by the blood of goats and bulls, but by his own blood shed on the cross. That is the glorious hope spoken of here in verse 12. But there's more. A turning to Jesus removes the veil from our hearts. God says here that the old covenant, the Ten Commandments, covered our hearts. If we look at the law as a way of getting right with God, we'll have closed ears to the gospel. But the glory even of the Old Testament is revealed in Jesus. It makes sense then, not as a set of rules to earn salvation, but as the promises of a faithful God to provide salvation. That's when we truly see what the Old Testament is about. We'll see his grace. We will glimpse his glory. We'll recognise how shameful it is to try and offer our faulty and incomplete obedience to him. And instead we'll be free. That's what verse 17 promises, isn't it? That as we see the splendour of Jesus, all the promises of the Old Testament fulfilled, as we see Jesus living for us, 
obedient for us, died and risen again for us, reigning in glory for us. We will see the ongoing, enduring, ever-increasing glory in our own lives. That's the difference Jesus makes. He does not just give us a set of demands and commands to keep, but he transforms us. He sets us free. He changes who we are and what we're like as with unveiled faces we contemplate his glory. See, that's, that's a truth that's built into the Old and New Testaments, isn't it? That what we look at, we become like. That's why idols are so dreadful, so deadly, that we become like what we look at. That the more we contemplate and think about the things of this world, our achievements, our power, our comfort, whatever it is, the more or the less like Jesus will become. But the more we look at him, the more he transforms us to be like himself. It'll change us the more we look at our glorious saviour. As we contemplate him and think about him and know him, we will see how magnificent he is and we will become more and more like our saviour. It's easy to look for glory other places, isn't it? It's easy to look for things that dazzle and amaze us in our families, things we can be proud of in our kids, in our own achievements, the people we know, the circles we move in, the respect that people hold us in. Those are all places we could look for glory and it's all glory that fades away. Our only glory, the only glory that will keep increasing, is the glory Jesus gives as we become like him. I can't think of a better, well, there are many other good reasons, but there's a really good reason to look to Jesus, isn't there? Where everything else fades and spoils, the glory Jesus gives will never end. Well, how can we sum up then the difference between Moses and Jesus? What has Jesus accomplished for us? Moses reveals the truth about God in the law, but in a way that could never save us. But Jesus, the mediator, reveals the truth about God in the gospel, saving, freeing and transforming everyone who turns to him. So go today certain the law will never save anyone. We have to turn away even from our best good works. And when we turn to Jesus, he'll set us free. He'll give us a hope that the law could never give. He will unveil himself to us in a way that transforms our hearts and our lives. Not just now, but forever. Have you turned to him? If you have, then... Keep on contemplating the Lord's glory and let's keep being transformed into his image together. Let me pray that that would be so. Our gracious God, you are holy and merciful. You are just and gracious. We thank you for revealing the law And showing us your character and nature. Thank you for showing us that we fall short of keeping even one of your commandments. And so causing our hearts to cry out for for a saviour. Just as the Israelites cried out to be delivered from their slavery in Egypt. So our God, your law points us to our need for salvation. We thank you that Jesus reveals what we could never have found in the law, that one true sacrifice for sin, the one who can not only make us good and righteous and holy today, but can deal with all of yesterday, 
can deal with our past, can secure our future in such a way that we will never ultimately fall away from you, and who assures us of a glorious future in your presence and gives us a taste of it today as your people. Now, God, help us to contemplate the Lord Jesus, to not ask what we must do to get right with you, but to think more and more on what he has done already to save us and make us his own. May it change us. May it change this church. May it change our community. May it change your world. We ask for your glory and in Jesus' name. Amen.